Hello and welcome to GameSec. It's time to check out some video games I only ever saw release here in North America. It doesn't happen often, but happens enough that this is the fourth episode on this very subject. And this first one, I'm surprised it didn't get a wider release as it honestly feels straight out of Japan. Check it out. First up, we have Monster Tail on the Nintendo DS from Dreamrift and Majesco. It was released in 2011. You play as a girl named Ellie who wakes up in a strange land and only wants to go home. She almost immediately encounters an egg, which hatches and an animal friend that you name Chomp helps you out. This one's a Metroidvania through and through. I mean, look at that map screen, it's straight out of Symphony of the Night. Not that that's a bad thing. You also gain new abilities which help you advance further. The game always points out where you should go next on your map. Your little animal helper adds a unique twist to the game as it's basically a virtual pet simulator too. When enemies drop certain items, they fall to the bottom screen. This is Chomp's domain. With a press of a button, you can send them down there to interact with all of those objects. This will give him experience and he'll eventually level up. Some of the objects down there can even be launched as weapons that rattle around on the top screen. You can equip Chomp with many different abilities and power-ups, which definitely come in handy. He can also evolve into different forms which have different abilities, so it can be rather involved. Fortunately, you don't have to pay a ton of attention to that if you don't want to. Just set him to where his specs are the best and just keep on playing. Chomp will help you fight enemies when he's on the top screen. In fact, sometimes he's the only way you can defeat certain bosses because he's the only one that can damage it. You'll also need him to activate certain switches or gears to help you navigate the map. Sometimes you have to send him to the bottom screen because a switch ends up down there. Some clever enemies even jump down to the bottom screen and start targeting you from there. So you'll need to send Chomp down there to beat them into submission. If you don't, then you're quickly going to regret it. Oh, and of course there's a shop in the game. You can power up Ellie here as she doesn't gain levels normally, and you can also buy stuff for Chomp to interact with. I recommend focusing on Ellie in the shops as things here are very expensive. Ellie eventually gets a lot of cool moves on her own. There is a lot of backtracking in this one, sometimes to the point of ridiculousness. For example, there might be a place you can't go, so you get a new ability on the other side of the game, and then you need to go all the way back to get past that part. Then, you immediately get an item which takes you all the way back again. Each time you go one way or the other, you'll need Chomp to activate these switches, which feels like it slows the game down, but in reality, it's not too bad. The game is plenty enjoyable, so stuff like this tends not to be much of a bother. Probably the most annoying thing is everything freezes when Chomp gains a level. It would make more sense if it was you who gained the level, but often Chomp is just down on the bottom screen doing his thing and you're not even paying attention to him when suddenly the screen freezes. It really catches you off guard. Again, the game's enjoyable enough to where this is only a minor annoyance. And of course, there are boss fights. Not a ton of them, but they are here. The graphics for the most part are fantastic. There's lots of colorful 2D backgrounds with some good parallax scrolling, and the sprite artwork is really nice too. This area right here reminds me of one of the stages from the first Earthworm Jim game. You know which stage I'm talking about? The music is fairly nice as well, though not as nice as the graphics. It certainly never gets annoying though. The game is around eight hours or so long, so it's fairly average, maybe a hair short for a Metroidvania. For me, this length isn't bad at all. You guessed it, and that's what she said. You can spend more time with it if you want to find absolutely everything, though. When I first captured the gameplay for this one, it ended up not having any audio in the recorded file. That meant that I had to go through this one again. And you know what? I really didn't mind. I did get a touch annoyed with the tutorial screens on my second go-around, though. They pop up each and every time something new happens. I couldn't tell you why this game was never released outside of North America. It's a great game, though it did come out towards the end of the DS's life, literally five days before the 3DS launched. Maybe the international publishers weren't interested. Regardless of that, be sure to give this one a go if you like Metroidvanias as much as I do.
This is NASCAR Rumble on the original PlayStation from Electronic Arts, released in the year 2000. Firstly, NASCAR isn't very popular outside of the US, so it's no surprise that this one stayed here. However, this is not a typical NASCAR racing game at all. Yes, you still race stock cars, and you can choose your car and driver at the start, and you can unlock more as the game goes on. But this one actually plays more like Mario Kart than a boring old NASCAR simulator. You'll notice that you're racing on interesting tracks instead of NASCAR stuff, not too dissimilar from Sega's Daytona USA. Next, you have items that you can collect during a race that can help you out. These usually do things like shield your tires from damage, give you a speed boost, and the like. There are also some items that can hurt your enemies, many of them weather-related like storms, twisters, and freezing your opponent's ability to steer. My favorite one is this little shockwave blast that knocks out cars near you. It is so satisfying to use. Hell yeah, see ya. Naturally, the enemy can do the same to you. Some of these attacks can be avoided by reducing your speed a bit as they approach, but not always. There's often shortcuts in each track for you to find as well, which makes the races even more fun. I like completely disregarding these switchbacks and going straight down, which of course would destroy a real car. There are a lot of tracks to race on here, with more to unlock. The graphics are fairly typical for the console, which certainly isn't bad, but they don't stand out among other games. The music is pretty good, with guitars by Derek Trucks. Each area has its own theme, but not each track. Your driver, or somebody, talks to you throughout each race. He's voiced by Jess Harnell, who was Wacko Warner in the Animaniacs cartoon. Like a rabbit on a dog track. If he starts getting on your nerves, and well, he probably will, you can shut him up in the sound options by lowering the voice volume all the way. In fact, I had to do quite a bit of adjustment to the various volume levels before I felt it was good, and these are the settings that I ended up with. Overall, this is a fantastic game that I feel is definitely overlooked. I think it could have had a wider audience without the NASCAR license. People who wanted NASCAR stuff probably wanted something a lot more boring and plain, and people who prefer interesting games didn't want a NASCAR title. So the license really worked against it in every possible way. Anyway, don't let the NASCAR moniker deter you. Be sure to give this one a go. This next one didn't exactly set the world on fire, or North America as it were, but it's not awful. The movie it's based on was a big budget flop, so that probably didn't help. Here's Mary Shelley's Frankenstein on the Sega Genesis. This was released in November of 1994 from Sony and Bit Studios. It's based on the 1994 movie of the same name. You play as Robert De Niro's version of the Frankenstein monster, or creature as he's called here. It first appears to be sort of an action platformer. You jump around and you can whack enemies with your little stick. You can add fire to your stick and maybe this makes it more powerful? I'm not sure, it's really tough to tell. You also have an energy attack which sucks away some of your life bar. However, this one is actually more of a puzzle game. In the first level, for example, you need to pull on all of the ropes that you can find, and some of them can be slightly hidden. This will move platforms into place or open up doors. You also need to venture indoors and wander the hallways. Here, you can find chests and you take what's inside. You have a collection of your items stored in the start menu. You'll also find clues because of course the creature can read. I like this one. Knowledge of physics may allow for a swift exit from the village. Knowledge of physics is a creature's specialty, or speciality since it takes place in Europe. Just having this paper gives him the knowledge as you'll need it when combining items to build your pulley. The next level is super dark, and you can't see anything. Fortunately, your torch stick can light everything up. But it doesn't last long, and places to get fire are not plentiful. Here, you need to push blocks to one notch or the other to open up a path. It really sucks when you can't see, because the graphics are so bad. Otherwise, the visuals are okay. The music in this one? Well, gotta admit, it could be worse. The game also came to the Super Nintendo the very same day. 
This one generally looks and sounds better than the Genesis game, but it still doesn't look or sound all that great. The gameplay here is pretty much identical, but in this one, I didn't have to solve a puzzle at the end of stage one. Instead, I had a boss fight. Turns out that I didn't use my knowledge of physics and instead had to brute force my way through. The torch effect in stage two looks better than the Genesis game, and of course it's much more realistic, but it leaves the rest of the screen too dark, which affects playability. Again, it doesn't last very long and you'll play most of the stage like this, which is not fun at all. Overall, the game isn't horrible, but I feel it could have used more time in the design department. Playing in the dark just isn't fun, and pulling ropes and pushing blocks gets tiresome. The next month, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein came to the Sega CD from Sony and Cygnosis. This one was restricted to North America as well. It's also entirely different from the cartridge game. This is more of an adventure, not dissimilar to point and click games. However, you control Robert De Niro directly instead of a cursor. You need to move about your world, collect items, and figure out the best way to use them. Keep in mind that this version of the Frankenstein creature is pretty smart, just like Robert De Niro, so he can talk, read, think, and he even has a slight sense of humor. Sometimes you'll get into a one-on-one -on -one fight. These control very poorly, because of course they do. What did you expect? Still, usually you can find a place and keep doing the same attack again and again until your foe dies. Like punching these guys in the nuts. It is a little concerning that blood is coming from their nuts and they keep coming back for more again and again. Unlike the cartridge game, this one gives you three lives instead of one. You just need to be careful because things like spiders will suck your life away really fast. Some parts of the game can be extremely maze-like as many of the screens that are stitched together look very similar. Overall, this one is much better than the cartridge game and actually quite enjoyable aside from a few minor annoyances. Unfortunately, it was never sold on its own. You had to buy the double pack that also included Bram Stoker's Dracula, and that's not necessarily a game you'd want to play. This is Mad Max for the NES, released in 1990 by Mindscape. It's more based on Mad Max 2, the 1981 movie. In this one, you drive around in your little car and you throw dynamite to attack cars who try to ram or kill you as well as towers that toss their own dynamite at you. The game calls these stages Road Wars. Be careful though, as you don't have a lot of dynamite and you can run out pretty fast. You need it to break through the barriers. And you need to get through those to advance in the stage. If you run out of dynamite and don't have the provisions to trade for more, the stage becomes impassable and you'll need to die or run out of gas to try again. Hidden in these stages are little sheds for you to find. Go inside and now you're on foot. Here, you need to gather all of the provisions that you can. That's food, water, gas, and ammo. You can also grab keys to unlock doors to rooms which may or may not have more provisions. You can shoot to defend yourself, but again, your ammo is limited. I like how the enemies explode when they die. It reminds me of the enemy deaths in Technocop on the Genesis, which came out around the same time. This makes sense because both games were originally designed by Grey Matter in 1988. Anyway, after this, you get back into your car and you need to find the shop. Here, you can buy more stuff like dynamite and gas, but you really need the arena pass to complete the stage. After you have that, you need to find the exit. The arena parts of the game are basically demolition derbies with the cars trying to ram each other off of the edge. You need to be the last one to survive. I find it easiest to try to let the cars get to me and then they drive into these holes which randomly open up. You can see how many enemies are left by pressing the select button. Once that number is down to one, well, that's you. And now you need to drive to the exit. And hopefully you make it before you run out of gas. These cars get crap mileage. Once you exit, you're back into another road war stage. You could tell it's different because it's a new color. Yeah, it's a pretty cheap way to signify a new stage instead of actually designing new graphics. Then you go to a new arena, which itself is a different color. There are three road war stages and three arena stages and a final boss. 
The control was odd for me. You'd think that the car uses tank controls, but no. It goes where you press on the D-pad. This was probably way more intuitive for the Simpletons back in 1990. It took me a while to get used to it as I was playing it today. The graphics are, eh, they're okay, and so is the music. The sound effects are really good though. I mean, the car sounds great for an 8-bit console, and it had better because that's pretty much all you hear for the entire game. Music only plays in the mine sequences when you're on foot. Overall, this isn't a fantastic game, but I wouldn't say it's totally awful either. You can tell it was made by Western developers who were still trying to figure video games out at the time. I am a bit surprised this didn't at least get a release in Australia. I mean, come on, the entire game takes place there. Do you remember all of those full motion video or FMV games for the Sega CD? Well, thankfully, we didn't get a lot of those the next generation on consoles like the PlayStation. However, I was always a little bit curious about this next one. Here's Fox Hunt on the PlayStation, released in 1996 from Capcom of all people. It was developed by 3Vision and comes on three discs. It also showed up earlier on Windows. This is an extremely wacky full motion video game that might make you think that everyone involved consumed copious amounts of cocaine. However, it almost plays like a point and click adventure. You control Andrew Bowen as Jack Fremont instead of a mouse cursor. He's a guy who's down on his luck. He's unwillingly recruited by the CIA to stop a Russian guy who's threatening to nuke LA because he didn't get screen credit on some TV shows he created. Like I said, it's wacky, almost to the point of being nonsensical. You directly control Jack, making him turn and look at new things, approach new areas, and even interact with objects in his environment. You can tell when you have control due to the flashing red cursor in the upper right. Like any good point and click adventure, it's often useful to check the same thing multiple times for different and new outcomes. Jack is pretty responsive to your inputs considering that the entire thing is based on video. Jack also has the occasional fight scene and you have punch, kick, and block buttons. This is where things can get a little troublesome as you're never really sure which one to press, so you just hit a random attack and hope it succeeds. The editing on these is so fast it's really hard to keep track of what the hell is going on. Maybe I just have good luck, but I never lost one of these fights. There are also some other action scenes that can drag on a bit, like rocketing through this hospital maze or this crosshair shooter scene, which is really tough due to the jerky nature of the video that keeps pausing. It's kind of ridiculous. There's also this scene where you need to shoot down a bunch of raw blows, but it's easier since the video doesn't jerk around as much. You can save at any time by pressing the select button. The game has a few different endings depending on what you do and the order in which you do it. Andrew Bowen is very over the top as Jack, but it's clear that's exactly what the producers wanted. The whole thing is insane. Some scenes seem to be in there just to show off a quick impression. He could have been a doctor. He could have, he could have been a doctor. Andrew Bowen would later go on to be a cast member on Mad TV. And he worked with Pat Kilbane, who you might remember from a couple of Game Sack episodes. His impressions were pretty damn good. Well, you know, I've done some action movies myself. Yes, Keanu has appeared in uh, Johnny Mnemonic, Ugh, for instance. Uh, it's Mnemonic. These days, Andrew is the voice of the Johnny Cage character in the modern Mortal Kombat games. Here's Johnny. Also, it's Where awesome that George Lazenby is in here, and he seems to be having a great time as well. Hello, Jack. And as previously mentioned, Rob Lowe is here too. I love my life. Don't look at me. Sadly, the quality of the video and audio here are not that great. It looks a little more acceptable on a CRT TV than it does here. Some of it looks really bad. I'm guessing that they probably had TV static in these clips, which is a video compression no-no. I'm not sure if the PC version features better or worse compression artifacts. You can switch the size of the image with the tap of the R2 button if you hate full screen video for some reason. I can fly! The dialogue is often hard to make out and sometimes it distorts. Like, listen, what the hell is he even saying here? I'm hungry! According to Andrew Bowen, he says, I'm hungry! Or how about this? Here, here, coming on. Here, here, 
But it's actually... I guess it helps that the plot barely makes any sense at all, so you don't feel too bad if you miss something. There's a good adventure style game here if you can look past the FMV and the overall silliness. It's way better and far more controllable than the likes of Wirehead on the Sega CD. After the game was released, they wanted to do a direct-to-video movie version. So they got back together to shoot some new scenes and make a complete video story. And some of those new scenes have Gary Coleman in them. Obviously, the video quality here is much better, and the audio quality is uh, slightly improved. They changed the story around a little bit and removed most of the video shot for the interactive parts. They even wrote a pilot for a potential TV series, which unfortunately never happened. Who's Daisy? Just my 31-inch cable-ready stereo NTSC color television. I'm sure this one was never released outside of North America because it was one of the last games in a dying breed. Overall, this is an incredibly silly game that's not for everyone. I like things that are absurd, in case you haven't noticed by the after credit sketches that I tend to do, so I personally find it amusing. It does have some cool adventure style segments that I like, but you might find some of the action scenes frustrating. Not many copies were sold unsurprisingly, so it goes for a pretty penny these days. This is Contra Force on the NES from Konami, released in 1992. This was being developed in Japan under the name Arkhound, but it was canceled there and, well, here we are with Contra Force. Interestingly, you're fighting human beings instead of aliens, and it also takes place in 1992 instead of in the future. So I guess it could be considered the first game in the Contra timeline. At first sight, it's a run and gun, but a really tough run and gun. In this one, you don't just grab a power-up, oh no. Instead, Konami felt that the Gradius style of powering up would work well here. So now, you collect suitcases. Once the power-up you want is highlighted, press select, and it's yours until you die. Your on-screen character, not you yourself. It's an interesting way of doing things in a run-and-gun. Like some of the other Contra games, you also have overhead run-and-gun segments to work your way through for a change of pace. You don't have very many lives, and once they reach zero, it's game over. You'll notice in the beginning that you can choose from four different characters, each with their own weapons. If you pause the game, you can switch to any other character at any time, and they each have their own stock of lives and they retain their power-ups. Switching between them isn't as snappy as Konami's first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, but it is a welcome feature nonetheless. Moreover, you can have Player 2 jump in at any point in the game using this method. Or you can have the CPU control Player 2 for a brief time to help you out. This can really help with boss battles. Just be careful though, because the CPU character can die when helping you, and their stock of lives will decrease if that happens. Using the second character is absolutely crucial in some parts. This game is wicked tough until you figure all of this stuff out. Most of the levels have a pretty good design to them, with the exception of things regenerating just off screen. However, you can use this to your advantage if you want to farm some power-up suitcases. I also found a cool trick if you hold down the jump button while exiting the pause screen. You'll jump again in mid-air, which makes the game a little bit less frustrating in some spots. The boss fights can be pretty fun, but again, you gotta be careful. All that said, this game feels practically broken. There is an intense amount of slowdown going on. It feels like my NES is seizing up, like I need to give it some oil or something. The controls could also be a bit more responsive. Sometimes the screen will refuse to advance, usually during your brief invincibility period after a death, but it fights you at other times as well. This game really needed more time in the oven. The graphics are pretty good for the console, and I love that so many parts of the background are destructible. In fact, that's where you'll usually find the power-up suitcases. This part here used to be impossible for me to pass without dying once, but it's super easy once you know to just blast them. The music is mostly great as well. There are no familiar Contra themes, and the music here isn't quite as memorable as the other Contra games, but it's better than a large portion of the library on the console. Overall, this is a bit of a letdown as far as Contra games go, but it's far from being the worst game in the series. I think it's worth trying out to judge for yourself.
I am surprised that it didn't get released anywhere else, but maybe Konami didn't have much confidence in it. And there you go, more games that are only released here. The rest of you missed out big time. It's what you get for living elsewhere, and I bet you're regretting it now. Filios, it's Filios. Could have been a contender, could have been a contender. It's you! Ah, you won't have to get past me! Whoa, whoa. Come get some! Yeah, I won! It's easy! <laughs>